respiratory system. To understand the process of breathing, in humans, the main organs responsible for respiration are present in the thoracic cavity. In the thorax region, the rib cage and a dome shaped fibrous tissue known as the diaphragm are observed. Present within the rib cage are the pleural membranes which enclose the lungs. The right lung is divided into three lobes, the right superior, right middle and the right inferior lobe. The left lung is smaller and has only two lobes, the left superior and the left inferior lobe. Both the lungs are associated externally with small tubular bronchi which unite and extend into the trachea. The trachea has incomplete C-shaped rings of cartilage which prevent the tracheal wall from collapsing. The trachea leads into the pharynx which is connected to the nostrils. As we breathe in air, the oxygen molecules enter the nostrils and travel downwards through the pharynx and trachea to finally reach the bronchi. From each bronchus, oxygen travels into the lungs. Within the lungs, the bronchus divides repeatedly to form bronchioles. Oxygen travels through these bronchioles and reaches the alveoli, each of which is surrounded by a network of capillaries. A section of one alveolus shows the presence of numerous alveolar chambers with pores. Blood containing RBCs is seen flowing through the capillaries. The oxygen molecules from the alveolus diffuse into the capillary and then get absorbed by the bluish purple RBCs. This causes oxygenation of the RBCs and a transition in their color from bluish purple to red is observed. The blood moving into the alveolus contains RBCs and carbon dioxide molecules. These molecules are released into the alveolus. The carbon dioxide collects in the alveolar chamber and then from the alveolus it travels through the bronchioles into the bronchus which finally reaches the trachea and is breathed out through the nostrils. So the process of breathing in air rich in oxygen is called inhalation. After the contraction of muscular diaphragm, the lungs expand and the air rushes in resulting in the inflation of alveoli. During exhalation, the diaphragm moves up and the lungs contract, thus the alveoli deflate causing the air to be forced out. This exhaled air is rich in carbon dioxide. This process of inhalation and exhalation is known as respiration, which is approximately 20 times per minute. Summary In the thorax region, the ribcage and the diaphragm are observed, which play a vital role in respiration. Present within the rib cage are the pleural membranes which enclose the lungs. The right lung consists of three lobes. While the left lung has only two lobes. Both the lungs are associated externally with bronchi which unite and extend into the trachea. As we breathe, the oxygen molecules enter the nostrils and travel downwards through the pharynx and trachea to finally reach the bronchi. From each bronchus, oxygen travels into the lungs. Within the lungs, the bronchus divides repeatedly to form bronchioles. Oxygen travels through these bronchioles and reaches the alveoli, each of which is surrounded by a network of capillaries.
as blood flows through the capillaries. The oxygen molecules from the alveolus diffuse into the capillary. This causes oxygenation of the RBCs. The carbon dioxide molecules are released into the alveolus. Let me introduce you to one of the bravest pioneers in the history of life on planet Earth. An organism that blazed the trail for every single vertebrate that lives on land today and many that don't. It's one of your most important ancestors. Meat? Well, it doesn't have a name. And we don't exactly know what it looked like either. But we do know that about 380 million years ago, this fishy looking thing with big fleshy fins achieved one of the animal kingdom's greatest milestones, breathing air. Sounds simple enough, but believe me, it wasn't. Because for billions of years before this fishy ancestor came around, basically all of life evolved in water. From the very beginning, the earliest, simplest forms of life, like bacteria, extracted oxygen they needed right from the water through their membranes. And they did it through simple diffusion, when a material automatically flows from where it is concentrated to where it is less concentrated, so it balances out. Diffusion works really well, and it requires zero effort, but it wasn't going to cut it in the big leagues. Anything larger than a small worm is simply too big and needs too much oxygen for diffusion to work. So in order to get bigger, early life forms needed a circulatory system that could move bulk amounts of oxygen around faster inside their bodies, and a respiratory system to bring more oxygen in contact with their wet membranes. So their respiratory surfaces moved from their outer surfaces to the insides of their bodies. First there were gills, but gills of course still only work inside of water. And a little more than 380 million years ago, this was starting to lose some of its charm. Earth was getting warmer, the seas were getting shallower, and much of the planet's surface water had lower concentrations of oxygen than it used to. Finally, a humble little lobe-finned fish got fed up, swam up to the water's surface, and started breathing air. It could do this because it had evolved a fancy new interface to move gases between the air and its cell membranes. I'm talking about lungs. Wet lungs. With an efficient new way to take in nearly limitless amounts of oxygen from air, animals were eventually able to get bigger and more diverse over the ages, and now all of us lung-having vertebrates share that common ancestor. For lots of animals, including humans, those lungs come with a bunch of other equipment, like protective ribs, a stiff trachea, and in mammals, a strong diaphragm. And together, they form your respiratory system, which happens to be best friends and business partners with your circulatory system. It's only by working together and using both both the bulk flow and simple diffusion of oxygen that they can make possible the process of cellular respiration. In other words, life itself. So a lot of improvements have been made to it over the eons, but the respiratory system that you are using right now is your inheritance from that ancient ambitious fish, leader of one of the most important anatomical revolutions of the past half billion years. Pretend for a minute that you can't breathe. Like, you just don't have lungs anymore. You are some bizarre evolutionary oddity, a huge human-shaped organism that doesn't have a respiratory system. Instead, you get all of your oxygen the way that your oldest, smallest evolutionary ancestors did, by simple diffusion. Or at least, you try to get all your oxygen that way. How would it work? Well, poorly. And that's partly because one of the keys to efficient diffusion of any material is distance. If you want a molecule to diffuse across a space quickly, you want it to be as close to its destination as possible with the fewest obstacles in the way. But for a single molecule of oxygen to diffuse from the air through, say, your scalp, and then go to a neuron deep inside your brain, it would have to move through your skin, and then your skull, and then your connective tissue, and all sorts of things. It would eventually get there, like maybe a month later, but at that point, the cell that needed the oxygen in the first place would have, you know, suffocated to death. Basically, obtaining oxygen through diffusion alone is like wanting to go to a party at your friend's place across town, and then walking 20 miles to get there. You could do it, but it would take forever, and by the time you arrived, you'd be all haggard and the party would be over. So diffusion alone isn't enough to get the job done. We do use it, but only when a whole bunch of the materials we need are right up against the tissues that can absorb them. So you know what else we need? 
Bulk flow. Bulk flow is like public transportation. It moves large numbers of molecules quickly. Rather than walk the whole way across town, you can hop on a bus with a bunch of other people and get there in 20 minutes. Every time you take a deep breath, you bring in about 100 quintillion oxygen molecules into your lungs all at once. They're on a bulk flow bus ride. And once those oxygen molecules filter down into the cells in your lungs, they're suddenly very close to the blood they're trying to reach. All they have to do is diffuse across four layers of cell membranes to get from the lung cell into the blood. It's like hopping off the bus and then walking a half a block to your friend's apartment. That's why your respiratory system is the way it is. It's set up to take full advantage of both bulk flow and simple diffusion. The bulk flow part of things is handled by some of your system's biggest and most obvious moving parts, starting with your lungs, which basically operate like a pump or a bellows. They don't have any contractible muscle tissue because they need to be able to expand, so they require outside help in order to move. Enter the diaphragm, a big thin set of muscles that separates your thorax from your abdomen. When your lungs empty, your diaphragm relaxes and looks kind of like an arc pushing up to squish your lungs. You also have the weight of your rib cage pushing on your lungs from the top and sides, and together these forces decrease the volume of your lungs. When you breathe in, your diaphragm contracts, pulling itself flat, and your external intercostal muscles between your ribs contract. They lift the ribs up and out, causing the chest cavity to expand. This makes the pressure inside your lungs lower than the air outside your body, and since fluids like gases move from areas of high pressure to low pressure, the lungs fill up with outside air. Then the diaphragm relaxes again and the weight of the rib settles in and the pressure inside the lungs becomes higher than the outside air and the air rushes out. And that, my friends, is breathing 101. Now your respiratory system contains a lot of parts besides your lungs, some prominently displayed on your face, others hidden deep within your chest, and functionally all of these organs fall into one of two physiological zones. The upper parts that funnel the air in make up what's known as the conducting zone and it starts with this thing. Your nose is supported by bone and cartilage and the bristly hairs and mucus inside it that help filter out dust and other particles. But it, along with your sinuses, performs another important function. It warms and moistens incoming air so it doesn't dry out those sensitive lung cells that must remain wet. Remember, moisture is key. We evolved from organisms that lived in water, so just like with our aquatic bacterial ancestors, we need water for oxygen to dissolve into before it can diffuse across the phospholipid bilayer membrane of our cells. Now, if you've ever choked on a poorly timed sip of water, you've noticed that you breathe through the same tube that you also move foods and liquids through. This is yet another leftover from those first fish lungs, which evolved as a branch off the esophagus. Looking back, it was not ideal, but we are stuck with it. So the stuff that you swallow soon encounters the epiglottis, a little trap door of tissue which covers the larynx and directs bites of sandwich and sips of cola towards your esophagus and keeps them out of your lungs. And you'll notice that the esophagus, which heads to your stomach, is nice and flexible, while your trachea, or windpipe, is rigid and has prominent rings. That's because your trachea is basically built like a vacuum hose. Since the lungs create negative pressure with every breath, the trachea needs those rings to keep it open. If it were soft and floppy, it would collapse every time the pressure dropped and you wouldn't be able to breathe. From there, the trachea splits in two, forming the right and left main bronchi. You can imagine these inner lung parts as sort of an upside down tree. Now we are in the lung tissue and have entered what we call the respiratory zone. This is where the actual gas exchange occurs and everything you find here has a form to suit that function. So the smaller branches of the upside down tree are bronchioles, which taper down into progressively narrower tubes until they empty into the alveolar ducts and then dead end into tiny alveolar sacs, where the bulk of the gas exchange finally occurs. Because that's where each sac contains a cluster of alveoli, these tiny cavities lined with super thin wet membranes made of simple squamous epithelium tissue. It's here that oxygen molecules dissolve in the wet mucus, diffuse across the epithelial cells, and then cross the single layer of endothelial cells lining the capillaries to enter the bloodstream. And of course it's also where carbon dioxide diffuses out of the blood and then follows the same route back up to the nose and mouth where it's exhaled. So it's your alveoli where diffusion meets bulk flow, because while you're picking up oxygen and dispensing with CO2 one molecule at a time, you're doing it in enormous quantities at any given second. Both of your lungs contain about 700 million alveoli, which together provide an amazing 75 square meters of moist membrane surface area. So the principles that make respiration possible are relatively simple, diffusion and bulk flow. And so are the mechanisms in your body that use them. It just took us about 400 million years to figure out how to make it all work. But today you learned how it does work, including the mechanics of both simple diffusion and bulk flow, and the physiology of breathing, and the anatomy of the conducting zone and the respiratory zone of your respiratory system. Thank you to all of our Patreon patrons who helped make Crash Course possible for themselves and for everyone in the world for free with their monthly contributions. If you like Crash Course and you want to help us keep making videos like this one, you can go to patreon.com crashcourse. This episode was filmed in the 
Dr. Cheryl C. Kinney Crash Course Studio. It was written by Kathleen Yale. The script was edited by Blake DiPestino, and our consultant is Dr. Brandon Jackson. It was directed and edited by Nicholas Jenkins. The script supervisor was Nicole Sweeney. Our sound designer is Michael Ronda, and the graphics team is Thought Cafe. Picture this. You're getting ready to give a big presentation in front of, like, a lot of important people. You're practicing in front of your mirror, and then, just for a second, you forget how to speak. Suddenly you feel that familiar sting of anxiety, like an icy hand on the back of your neck. You look at yourself in that mirror, and you start imagining some of the worst, worst-case scenarios. Like, what if you totally lose your train of thought up there? What if you barf? What if everybody gets up and leaves? Now you're really nervous. I'm getting freaked out just talking about it. So you start taking quick, shallow breaths, and you're feeling lightheaded and seeing stars, and now you, my friend, are hyperventilating. When we talk about respiration, we tend to focus on oxygen, and who could blame us? It's easy to forget the equally important role that carbon dioxide plays in maintaining homeostasis. Your internal balance between oxygen and carbon dioxide factors heavily into all sorts of stuff, especially in your blood, where it can affect your blood's pressure, its pH level, even its temperature. And now, at like T minus five minutes to your presentation, all of those things are out of whack because you're exhaling more CO2 than you should. You're just about to faint when a friend suddenly hands you a paper bag to breathe into, and you've never been so grateful for a lunch bag in your life because somehow it does the trick. Within seconds, you're back to normal. The drop in CO2 that occurs in your blood when you hyperventilate is called hippocapnia, and it signals a breakdown in one of the most complex and important functions that your respiratory system performs. That is, the exchange of gases inside your blood cells, where the stuff your body doesn't want is swapped out for what it desperately needs. This exchange between carbon dioxide and oxygen is regulated by a whole series of biological signals that your blood cells use to communicate with your tissues about what they have, what they want, and what they need to get rid of. It's almost like a code, one that's written into your blood's chemistry, in the folding of its proteins, even in its temperature and acidity. It's what allows you to perform strenuous physical tasks like climbing a mountain. It's also what lets you reboot your whole respiratory system with nothing more than a paper bag. I'll admit it. When we've talked about the chemistry of your blood so far, we've tended to keep things pretty simple. Like, hemoglobin contains four protein chains, each of which contains an iron atom, since iron readily binds with oxygen. That's how hemoglobin transports oxygen around your body. Bada-bing! But the fact is, hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen isn't always the same. In some places, we want our hemoglobin to have a high affinity for oxygen, so it can easily grab it out of the air. And in others, we want it to have a low affinity for oxygen, so it can dump those molecules to feed our cells. So how does your hemoglobin know when to collect its precious cargo, and when to let it go. Well, a lot of it has to do with a principle of chemistry known as partial pressure. One of the things that fluids always do is move from areas of high pressure to low pressure. And molecules also diffuse from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. But when we talk about gases in a mixture, we need to combine the ideas of pressure and concentration. See, air is a mixture of molecules, and when you're studying the respiratory system, you often need to focus on the oxygen, which makes up about 21% of it. But that doesn't actually tell us how many oxygen molecules there are. For that, we need to know the overall air pressure, since more molecules in a certain volume means more pressure. So partial pressure gives us a way of understanding how much oxygen there is based on the pressure that it's creating. Example. The pressure of air at sea level is about 760 millimeters of mercury, but since only about 21% of that air is oxygen, oxygen's part of that pressure, or partial pressure of oxygen, is 21% of 760, or about 160 millimeters of mercury. Now, that's just outside at sea level. When that air mixes with the air deep in your lungs, including a lot of air that you haven't exhaled yet, the partial pressure of oxygen drops to about 104 millimeters of mercury. And in the blood that's entering your lungs after most of its oxygen oxygen has been stripped away by your hungry muscles and neurons, the oxygen partial pressure is only about 40 millimeters. This big difference in pressure makes it easy for oxygen molecules to travel from the outside air into your blood plasma, because as a rule, dissolved gases always diffuse down their partial pressure gradients. This is why it's so much harder to breathe at higher altitudes. When you climb a mountain, the concentration of oxygen stays at about 21 percent, but the pressure gets lower, which means the partial pressure of oxygen also decreases to about 
45 millimeters of mercury at the top of Mount Everest. So the partial pressure of oxygen at the top of the highest peak in the world is almost the same as the deoxygenated blood that's entering your lungs. So basically, there is no partial pressure gradient, which makes it really hard to get oxygen into your blood. But let's get back to the red blood cells. Remember that the globin in your hemoglobin is a protein, and when proteins bind to stuff, they tend to change shape, and that shape change can make the protein more or less likely to bind to other stuff. When an empty hemoglobin runs into an oxygen molecule, things are a little awkward. It's like a first date. Bonding isn't so easy. But once they finally bind, hemoglobin suddenly changes shape, which makes it easier for other oxygen molecules to attach, like friends gathering around the lunch table. That affinity for joining in, or cooperativity as it's known, continues until all four binding sites are taken and the molecule is fully saturated. Now your hemoglobin is known as oxyhemoglobin, or HBO2, and it, it is not, not why the cable network is called that. That's the home box office. Anyway, by the time the blood leaves the lungs, each hemoglobin is fully saturated, the oxygen partial pressure in your plasma is about 100 millimeters, and now it is ready to be delivered to where it is needed most. Active tissues like the brain, heart, and muscles are always hungry for oxygen. They burn through it quickly, lowering the oxygen partial pressure around them to about 40 millimeters. So when the blood arrives on the scene, oxygen moves down the gradient from the plasma to the tissues to feed those hungry cells. That makes the oxygen partial pressure in your plasma drop, so your hemoglobin starts to give up more of its oxygen to the plasma. But partial pressures are only part of what's prodding your hemoglobin to give up the goods. All that metabolic activity going on in your tissues is also producing other triggers in the form of waste products, specifically heat and CO2. Both of those things activate the release of more oxygen by lowering hemoglobin's affinity for it. Say you're climbing that mountain again and your thighs are feeling the burn, red blood cells saturated with oxygen are going to the muscle tissue in your quads where the hemoglobin can dump a bunch of O2 because of the lower partial pressures of oxygen in your muscles. But a hard-working quad will also heat up the surrounding tissues, and that rise in temperature changes the shape of hemoglobin, and it does it in such a way that it lowers its affinity for O2. So when those red blood cells hit that warm, active tissue, they release even more oxygen, like 20% more beyond what partial pressures would trigger. But wait! There's more! Carbon dioxide triggers the release of oxygen, too, because it also binds to the hemoglobin, changing its shape again, lowering its affinity for oxygen still more. And as oxygen jumps ship, the hemoglobin can pick up more CO2. Finally, just in case the hemoglobin isn't getting the message at this point, there's one more trigger that your respiratory system has up its sleeve. The spike in CO2 that's released by your active muscle tissues actually makes your blood more acidic. Since your blood is mostly water, when CO2 dissolves in it, it forms carbonic acid, which breaks down into bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. Those ions bind to the hemoglobin, changing its shape yet again, further lowering its affinity for oxygen. So now, at last, your tissues have the oxygen they need, and your red blood cells are stuck with all this CO2 that they need to get rid of. Your red blood cells ride the vein train back to the lungs, where they encounter a new wave of freshly inhaled oxygen. And when that O2 binds to the hemoglobin, which again is hard at first, it eventually changes its shape back to the way it was when we started, which decreases its affinity for CO2. So the hemoglobin drops its carbon dioxide, which moves down its partial pressure gradient into the air of your lungs so you can exhale it and the whole thing can start all over again. Now, if that isn't enough to make you hyperventilate, I'm not sure what is. But this brings us back to that unfortunate episode you had before your big presentation. This whole complex code of chemical signals that I just described, well, it assumes that what your cells and tissues are telling each other is actually true. But as we all know, sometimes our bodies don't mean what they say. Thanks, buddy. Like when you're freaking out about your presentation, your sympathetic nervous system makes your heart race and your breathing increase to prepare you to fight or flee. The problem is, there's nothing to actually fight or flee from, so your muscles aren't actually doing anything, so they're not using all the extra oxygen you're breathing in. And they also aren't producing the extra CO2 that you're suddenly exhaling all over the place. So when you start to exhale CO2 faster than your cells release it, its concentration in your blood drops. And with less carbonic acid around, your blood's pH starts to rise. And you know what else? While low blood pH does things like change the shape of your hemoglobin to deliver oxygen, high pH causes vasoconstriction. Normally, this is supposed to divert blood from the parts you're not using during times of stress, like your digestive organs, to the parts that you are using. But when you hyperventilate, this constriction happens everywhere, which means less blood is delivered to your brain, which makes you lightheaded. Luckily, that trick with the breathing into the paper bag, it really does work. It works because it lets you breathe back in all of the CO2 you just breathed out. So the partial pressure of carbon dioxide 
dioxide in the bag is higher, which forces that CO2 into your blood, which lowers its pH, and you get back to homeostasis. And of course, homeostasis is the key to life. And you know, also to a successful presentation. If you were able to remain calm today, you learned how your blood cells exchange oxygen and CO2 to maintain homeostasis. We talked about partial pressure gradients and how they, along with changes in blood temperature, acidity, and CO2 concentrations, change how hemoglobin binds to gases in your blood. And you learned how the thing with the bag works. Of course, we must say thank you to our patrons on Patreon who help make Crash Course possible through their monthly contributions, not just for themselves, but for everyone. If you like Crash Course and want to help us keep making videos like this one, you can go to patreon.com slash crash course. This episode was filmed in the Dr. Cheryl C. Kinney Crash Course Studio. It was written by Kathleen Yale. The script was edited by Blake T. Pestino, and our consultant is Dr. Brandon Jackson. It was directed and edited by Nicole Sweeney. Our sound designer is Michael Aranda, and the graphics team is Thought Cafe.